Welcome to worship at Grand Avenue United Methodist Church. Today I'm bringing you greetings from our balcony. If you are like most people, when you attend worship in person, when you go to the theater or concerts, to sporting events or movies, you probably sit in about the same place every single time. I once served a church where there was a gentleman who always sat on a bench in the balcony just like this one. Some people said it was because he liked to look down on everyone else, but he said, oh no, just in case the rapture comes, I want to help Jesus out by being just a little bit closer. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I do know that when I worship in a place regularly, if I change the place where I'm sitting, sometimes it changes my perspective. It certainly would be so if I came and sat in a balcony seat like this. When you change the perspective, you change the way that you see God, the way that you see yourself, and sometimes the way that you see the world around you. Think about the number of stories that there are in the Bible where people pull away for a time and go up usually to a higher place, like Moses on the mountaintop receiving the Ten Commandments, or the Magi on the back of their camels staring at a, a star high off in the east. These are times that God is being revealed and we are invited to see God and see ourselves and see the world around us in a different light. Today in the ninth chapter of Luke's gospel, we get such an opportunity to go with Peter and James and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. There the presence of God, the power of the Holy Spirit will descend and Jesus's face becomes bright with the light of transfiguration, and they see in his face, in his countenance, the glory of God. It changes the way that they will look at Jesus from that point on and forevermore. And it gives us the same opportunity. As we're worshiping today, I hope that maybe you'll follow along with the scripture. It's a part of the order of service that's in the links and comments attached to this uh, video. Likewise, while you're there, you can find a place where you can register your attendance and share a prayer concern with us if you would like. And finally, there's a place there where you can make a donation, either by text or online or through the mail, to further the work that God is doing here in this place, building faith, bringing hope, and reaching out in love. As we do, I hope that you pray that God will open your eyes, that you may indeed have a revelation today. To that end, let us pray. Holy God, upon the mountain you revealed our Messiah, who by his death and resurrection would fulfill both the law and the prophets. By his transfiguration, enlighten our path, that we may dare to suffer with him in the service of humanity, and so share in the everlasting glory of him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Amen. Now, friends, let us rejoice as we go to the piano and Loella Cherry leads us in praise with Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise.
Good morning. Today is a special day in the church. It is called Transfiguration Sunday. That's a long word that means changing something or someone in how they look. I have glasses. I have to have them because they change things so that I can read things and see things. Our Bible story today tells us that one day Jesus took three of his disciples on a long hike up the mountain. Something special happened when they reached the top of the mountain. Jesus was praying and suddenly he started glowing bright. His face shone like the sun and his clothes were glowing white. The disciples were so surprised and scared. God told them in a loud voice, this is my son, listen to him. Now they knew more about Jesus. They knew because Jesus was the son of God, he would teach them about what to say and what he wanted them to do. Now they could shine with God's love so other people could know about God's power and love. That's our good news for today. Let us pray. Dear God, we praise you, Jesus. You are God's Son. Help us remember his power and glory. Amen. Today's scripture is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. Listen now for the word of God. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which was about to bring fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time what they had seen. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of Holy Scriptures. Thank you. 
you join me in the prayer to the Holy Spirit? Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and we shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who, by the light of the Holy Spirit, did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Each year, on the last Sunday after the Epiphany, just before we began our Lenten journey toward Calvary and the cross, just before we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. For indeed, we stand apart on a mountaintop experience called transfiguration, and sometimes in Matthew's words, and sometimes in Mark's words, and this year, in Luke's words, we hear the story of how Christ's face was transfigured before his followers, and they saw shining in his countenance the very glory of God. It happens from time to time. In the stories of the Old and New Testament, people pull away to a high place, and they see things from a different perspective. They see themselves differently. They see the world differently, and they see God differently. The Bible refers to numerous mountaintop experiences. Sometimes people in the Bible literally feel as if they're on top of the world, and sometimes they feel as if the weight of the world is on top of them. It was on Mount Moriah that Abraham felt that God was calling him to offer his son, his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice. Abraham surely felt at that moment that the mountain was on him. But just in the nick of time, God opened Abram's eyes and he beheld a ram that was caught in the thicket. And just as he had prophesied to his son Isaac, the Lord indeed provided. And suddenly Abraham was on top of the mountain again. And then, turning from Genesis to the book of Exodus, on Mount Sinai, Moses received the Ten Commandments. Certainly that was a mountaintide experience. But when he came down from the mountain, he found that the people that he had been leading out of slavery in Egypt and over to the Promised Land had become impatient because he was detained on the mountain. And so they had fashioned for themselves a golden calf and they were indulging in all manner of vile practices. And suddenly, Moses, who had been on top of the mountain, found that the weight of the mountain was on top of him. And then in the book of Kings, on Mount Carmel, Elijah had his great contest with the prophets of Baal and won a spectacular victory. He was on the mountaintop, but soon, he was on the run, thanks to the wicked queen Jezebel. He ended up hiding in a cave where he felt that the weight of the mountain was weighing down upon him. Even our Lord was certainly acquainted with mountains. One of the temptations of Christ took place on a high mountaintop. Temptation can find us anywhere whether high on the mountain following a warm and wonderful baptism or other high spiritual experiences, or whether it's down in the valley of death and despair. After the temptation experience, Jesus had other memorable experiences on mountaintops. It was on the Mount of Olives that Jesus regularly retreated for a time of prayer. It was there that he was kneeling and praying, not my will but yours be done when his betrayer came and betrayed him with a kiss. And who can forget that among Jesus' greatest teachings, told by Matthew, they are called, of course, the Sermon on the Mount. And here today, we have this wonderful story. This lesson from Luke's Gospel is the ultimate 
mountaintop experience. All of this occurred just after Peter, for the first time, has professed that no matter what anyone else says about who Jesus is or what he does, that Peter is convinced that he is indeed the Christ. And Jesus begins to reveal to him exactly what lies ahead. And for the first of three times in Luke's gospel, Jesus proclaims that he will indeed be betrayed, that he will be crucified, dead, and buried, and on the third day he will rise from the dead. Surely the disciples were both shocked and confused. After all, this wasn't what they signed up for when they left everything to follow Jesus. They thought they were following him to the establishment of a new kingdom, not to the end of his life, to the end of their lives. Peter is the one who spoke up and protested that this could never happen. And Jesus, who had just named him Peter instead of Simon, because Peter means rock, instead of being the rock upon which he would build his church, was called instead a stumbling block. And Jesus said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Just a few days later, eight days later, Luke says, Jesus called his inner circle aside. They went on a mountaintop retreat. There they would see things from a different perspective. But nothing could have prepared them for what they beheld there. For one thing, they saw a sudden change come over Jesus and his countenance. He appeared in a brilliant light. As Mark tells it, his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could possibly bleach them. The disciples knew Jesus was special, but they had never experienced anything like this. And as if that were not enough, then all of a sudden they had the apparition that Moses and Elijah were there on the mountain with him. Moses, you recall, gave the people the Ten Commandments and led them to the Promised Land. And Elijah, Elijah was the first prophet and was taken up into the heaven in a chariot of fire. And the Jewish people believed that Elijah would one day return in the same way that he had departed, on the wings of a chariot. And these two men, Moses and Elijah, representing the fullness of the law and the prophets, the sources of authority for all Jewish people, were here standing on that mountain with Christ. This was surely the ultimate mountaintop experience. For one thing, it left Simon Peter absolutely speechless. I think that Simon Peter must have been a Methodist because when he had a mountaintop experience, the only thing that he could come up with to do was to start a building program. And so it was that he asked, do you want us to build a, a shelter, build a little booth for Moses and one for Elijah and one for you? And the answer that he got was that uh, a cloud descended upon the mountain and suddenly there was a voice coming out of the cloud, the voice of God, saying to him and to all who were within earshot, this is my son, listen to him. Chances are that even if the disciples hadn't been listening to him before, they were listening to him now, it would be from now on. I mean, wouldn't you? If you had experienced such an extraordinary event, wouldn't you conclude that you had better give Christ your undivided attention? And after all, isn't that what Jesus wants most? Our undivided attention? A voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Let me ask you this. What difference would it make, do you think? What difference would it make in your life if you listened to Christ? What difference might it make in our church if we all listened to Christ? Can you imagine the difference that it might make in God's world if everybody listened to Christ? I mean, if we not only claimed and celebrated him as our Savior, but if we pledged ourselves to serve him as our Lord. It's never a mistake to listen to Christ's voice and to obey that voice. When we do, we discover what life is really all about. Indeed, we discover new 
life. The season of Lent that lies before us gives us opportunities to listen to Christ. In the comments and description attached to this video, you'll find a newsletter and an order of service that shares ways that you can be a part of hearing the voice of Christ speaking to you through the scriptures. You might be a part of a Bible study, or you might simply begin reading the scriptures that we are centering our worship on from week to week. A second way that you might be listening for Christ this Lenten season is through the power of prayer. Indeed, our worship series for the season of Lent is going to be focused on the Lord's Prayer, the model of prayer that Jesus gave to his disciples then and gives to us now. We're going to be considering the significance of each phrase of that prayer and applying it in our personal and our corporate lives. The third way is that we might be listening for the call of Christ in our lives to respond in mission and in ministry. No sooner have Peter and James and John come down from the mountain, their mountaintop retreat with Jesus, than they encounter a boy who is demon-possessed. The other disciples were not able to cast the demons out, and Christ does. We go from a mountaintop experience to the midst of the mission field. And my hope and my prayer is that you will be listening to the stirrings of the Spirit, the calling of Christ in your life to respond to mission and ministry. And again, there are links in the comments and description that will describe ways that you can get involved in serving through Grand Avenue United Methodist Church. As soon as the cloud had descended, and just as quickly as Moses and Elijah had appeared, all of a sudden, in the end, they were gone. And Luke's account ends with these words on the mountaintop. When the voice of God had spoken, Jesus was found alone. Jesus was all that the disciples had, and he was all that they needed. When they gave him their undivided attention, their lives were filled with his power and their witness touched the entire world and is touching it still today. And I wonder if those words, the voice of God, was what was echoing in their ears when once upon a mountaintop called Calvary, they confronted an old rugged cross. Do you remember? On a hill far away, stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Friends, both on your mountaintop experiences and in the valley of death and depth and doubt and despair. My hope and my prayer is that God will be with you, that his spirit will surround you, that Christ will speak to you, and that you will listen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.